If men are depraved sinners, we come to the question for today, who do not seek God and therefore need God to effectually draw or usher them into salvation through the Holy Spirit, opening their eyes, regenerating their heart, then we must ask, who decides who will be saved and why? So if there's a work of the Holy Spirit where he's calling certain individuals to make this third group, why them? Who decides that? And why, what was it about those who were called that they were saved? That's the question we need to ask today. Isn't that the logical follow-up? Does that make sense? We're just asking basic questions. Here's what we're doing. With our soteriology, we want our soteriology, our understanding of salvation, to be determined based upon Scripture and Scripture alone. We don't want to just say, well, this I think this makes sense, so yeah, let me go there. We want to go to Scripture and see, how does this thing happen? First of all, let's build the house. The foundation is, we're in a really bad condition. The very first question I asked you, I think one of them, in week one was, why do we need salvation? Because we're in trouble, okay? So if we're in trouble, how does anybody get saved? And we looked at the nature of this trouble, that we choose trouble. We're not innocent bystanders who are in a bad situation. We ourselves are guilty, and we hate God, and we want our sin. Man, that's big trouble. So how do we get saved? Well, Scripture tells us very clearly God pulls us out of trouble. He says, you, I'm going to save you. Well, now the next question to ask is, well, why that guy and not that guy? Why you and not the guy next to you? What is it that determines who's going to be saved? And so this week we come to the doctrine commonly called unconditional election or the sovereign choice of God. God's decision to save some people not because of anything they did to earn or deserve it, but simply because of his grace and mercy. Can someone read the definition? I, ch- I like John Piper's definition of unconditional election. Can someone read that for us? Unconditional election is God's free choice before creation, not based on foreseen <coughs> faith, to which traitors he will grant faith and repentance, pardoning them and adopting them into his everlasting family of joy. Okay, we're going to delve into this from probably the most prominent or well-known text passage in Scripture that deals with this doctrine. But Piper has said unconditional election is God's free choice before creation, not based on foreseen faith, not him looking ahead and saying, who's going to pick me, so I'll pick them, to which traitors... I like, I like that of Piper. He's calling us traitors. He doesn't just say sinners. We're traitors. We've actually turned against God. We've, we've turned our backs on him. He will grant faith and repentance, pardoning them, adopting them into his everlasting family of joy. So let's turn to Romans chapter 9, and we'll walk through this. Lord willing, we will walk through the first half of the chapter this week, and then in two weeks from now, Michael will be preaching next week um, from Ephesians but in the morning, but then the week following, we'll seek to pick up the second half of Romans chapter 9. And we'll look through this doctrine of election and, and give this some, some time in our, our, our morning study. Before we jump into Romans chapter 9, let's actually look <coughs> at the last few verses of Romans chapter 8. Here's the setting. Romans chapter 8 is one of the most glorious chapters because of its condensed uh, subject matter on the promises Christians have in Christ. It's amazing. Walk through Romans chapter 8. Memorize Romans chapter 8. Know Romans chapter 8. The truths in Romans chapter 8 will blow you away. Let's read the last few verses of Romans 8. And I want to highlight a couple of things because it really, it really um, gives us a head start into Romans 9. Look at Romans chapter um, 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. There's the reality of the call that we saw in 1 Corinthians 1. For those whom he foreknew, he's speaking of God, he also predestined. That's predestined. So in John Piper's uh, definition of before the foundation of the world, there it is. He predestined, he predetermined 
these to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he also called, those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's commonly been referred to as the golden chain, I believe, the golden chain of salvation, where every link in the chain is absolutely essential here. Where does it begin? God's foreknowledge before the foundation of the world. He predetermines who he's going to conform to the image of his son. Those who he predestined or predetermines, he calls them. Those whom he calls, he justifies, which means he saves them. He says, not guilty. Those whom he justifies, he glorified. Do you see that chain of events? It's not, he doesn't say, those who he predestined, he called most of them. And of those that he called, some of them he saved and justified. And then out of those that he justified, some of them made it to the end and were glorified. That's not what he says. He says, if you've been predestined before the foundation of the world, you will be called, you will be justified, you will be glorified. That's the promise. That's an incredible promise. That has to do with our salvation, the, um, the definite justification of the believer. That has to do with the preservation of the saints. That if you've been justified, you will make it to the end. He will lose none of all that the Father gives him, not a single one. It's as good as done. If you've been justified, He glorified you. It's as good as done. He's saying it's past tense. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so then Paul goes on, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? There it is. Who shall bring any charge against those that God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This is what he's just said. He said, if you have been justified in Christ, if you are looking to Jesus Christ and you've turned from your sin and put your faith in Him, if you've repented and believed, been washed by the blood of Christ, if Jesus Christ has accounted His death to your account and your filth and sin to His account and His righteousness to yours, if you've been saved by Christ, if, Jesus, if God in His courtroom has said not guilty, guess what? No one can bring a single charge against you. Nothing. The devil, the slanderer, comes and says, yeah, but you're too vile for Christ. You say, who's to condemn? Christ Jesus died for me. He died for me. And more than that, right now, he's interceding for me. He's still my advocate. You have nothing against me, sin. You have nothing against me, Satan. You can't bring a charge against me. I'm I'm free. There's no condemnation. That's a glorious reality, reality. And then we say in verse 35, look at this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Christian, you ought to sink your uh, teeth into this truth here and get to know it. He says, who shall separate you from the love of Christ? What is going to tip? You know how often we can condemn ourselves and feel like we've separated ourselves from the love of Christ because of our actions and Christ doesn't love me so much today. He loved me more yesterday because I was doing so good, but now I've kind of failed in this area or that. And so I feel like God doesn't love me so much. Listen, know this. Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now you could say right there, yeah, I get that. Nothing out there can separate me. But what about my own failings? What about my own failures? What about my own sin? Well, listen to this. Verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from this love of Christ. If you're in Christ, He's holding you with His hand, with the Father's hand. You will not be separated from that love. Glorious promises of Romans chapter 8. I would like to, in the near future, spend some time there and really dig into those. Um, And so maybe the Lord will provide opportunity for that.
But I wanted us to just read that leading up to chapter 9. So here we come to Romans chapter 9. On the heels of these incredible promises, the Apostle Paul begins Romans chapter 9, the first five verses, he presents to us a major problem. Someone read uh, 1 through 5 for us, please. belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who God is over all, who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. Let me ask you first, who is the Apostle Paul? He's a Benjamite. Okay, so the Apostle Paul from the tribe of Benjamin is Jewish. Okay? He was Saul. He was he was the the no one greater in, knew the law. Paul was, or Saul, was the l- most learned, the most devout. He was actually chasing Christians, seeking to put them to death. He was a devout Jew. And so what's the problem here that he poses in the opening chapters of Romans 9? It's absolutely critical that we understand this because it sets up the entire chapter. What does Paul say in these opening verses? He presents to us a problem. What is it? Fellow Jews are unbelievers. How do we get that? You wish that you were a person cut off for their sake. Okay, so look at verse 3. I wish that I myself were a curse and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's speaking of Jews. Now, why is that a problem? <clears throat> Is he just saying, man, I just wish, like we could say, man, I just wish everybody in Laredo, everybody who's from Laredo, I just wish they were all saved. Is that what he's saying? No, he's saying that, you know, know, everything, that's what it says in in 4 and 5, the glory and the covenants and the law and the promises and everything are for them. I mean, Abraham first received his promise and the Jews came from Abraham, so that's where it originated. Do you guys get that? Yeah, Ashley, go ahead. Sorry. It's like you said, uh, like, what is he saying in verse 3, right? Mm-hmm. He's not just saying that he wants everybody to be saved. He's saying that he would actually like, give up his faith and salvation for someone else to get saved. Okay. So that's, what, that's his conclusion. As I would even, you know, you look at these glorious realities of Romans 8, and he says, I, all of this incredible truth and beauty that we have in Christ, all of this incredible privilege that we have in salvation, I wish I could be cut off from that for the sake of others. So that's his conclusion. But what, what uh, Kathleen just said, he said, okay, so verses 4 and 5 tell us something about why this is such a major problem. This isn't just a heartache for Paul. Like, you look at your family and say, oh, I wish they were saved and there's a heartache. But there's actually a problem. There's actually something that seemingly doesn't connect here. And Kathleen said it. Who was, who was God's chosen people? Israel. They, she said, okay, so reading verse 4, they are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law the worship, the promises. Not every nation is given. You know, we live in the New Covenant age where this is going forth to the nations. So people know about the Bible. It has nothing to do with their ethnic heritage. People we just assume in this country especially know scripture. But the Israelites were a small group of people chosen among the whole world. This Millions of people, the Israelites alone, are chosen and God revealed to them His Word. God gave to them promises. What were the promises? 
says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. More, your descendants will be more than the stars of heaven. The promised land was given to them. Peace and rest. God has given promise after promise. To them belongs the adoption, the glory, covenants. He gave them the law. He did not, God did not, but for a handful of people in the Old Testament, God did not reveal his glory and the nature of who he was as the one true God to these darkened nations. He sent judgment to them. Israel was the means by which he just judged these people. They would go in, destroy entire nations because of their evil, wicked, vile living. They, but they didn't even know God. That God did not reveal to them his covenants. They were in darkness. God allowed Satan to blind the minds of unbelievers to such an extent they were in complete total darkness in a way they are not today. We have this gospel going forth. So the Israelites were God's chosen people. So as Saul, Paul's saying this, he's thinking back of this whole Old Testament, this whole thing addressed to Israel. That's a massive chunk addressed to Israel. Promises of hope and glory and the adoption, the worship, the law, the covenants. So why is it, what's Paul saying then? If all that's been given to them, he's saying they're not saved. They're going to hell. They've rejected it. So his anguish is, I wish I could be cut off for their sake, because they're going to hell. And yet they've been given all of this privilege, but they're rejecting it and facing eternal damnation. I want them to be saved. So you can write in there, I put a blank space for your answer. What is the major problem that Paul poses in these first five verses? The Israelites, the ethnic Israelites are perishing. They're going to hell. They're not saved. So, what could be the rational conclusion from that point if you say, okay, Paul, you've just presented this to us. The majority of Israelites here, your kinsmen according to the flesh, you say, are perishing. Though they've been given the promises, the covenants, the law, the blessings, the adoption, and they're, per they're going to hell. Something's not connecting here. What could be the first objection in your mind? If you're thinking God's chosen this people, He's revealed himself. Maybe God's doing something wrong. God's, did God do something wrong? Wait a second, God, this isn't lining up. I thought these were your chosen people. To them belong all of the blessings. Why are they perishing and going to hell? What do you, are you, have you failed God? God, have you, have you done something wrong? What's happening here? That's the objection. And how does Paul answer it? Look there at verse 6. Someone read verse 6 to us. <clears throat> he says, it's not as though the word of God has failed. Because that's what people are going to think. They're going to say, wait, we have this massive Old Testament, all these promises, but the Israelites are perishing. God's not fulfilled his promises. You know, his promise that he was going to bring them into the land and give them peace and rest, that his promise that he was going to bless their offspring forever and ever and ever, and it's not happening. So God's word has failed? Well, he says, no, it's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So Paul makes an assertion there. God's word hasn't failed. Why not? What's his assertion? Not everyone who is a physical Jew, a physical Israelite, descended through Abraham's bloodline, not all of them are spiritually elect Israel. Not everyone who's born a Jew is God's spiritually chosen people. There is, you could say, an Israel within Israel. 
there are those within Israel, national Israel, that are spiritually chosen within Israel. Several months ago, or a month or two, I don't remember now, I preached the message about the remnant. And remember that the biblical theme throughout all of Scripture of God saving a remnant. Remember we have the promise that God would save His people, just a remnant. The Israelites, He revealed Himself and He saved them from the world. The Israelites went into captivity in Egypt. And what did God do? Well, before, before that, what did He do? He brought all of national Israel out of Egypt, right? This massive exodus. And then what did He do? Daniela said he chose a third of them. We see, we read that in uh, Zechariah, that a third will be chosen from Israel. So there you've got a remnant within the remnant. We read that the majority of Israelites who were brought out of Egypt in the Exodus rejected God and perished. A whole generation he destroyed because of their rebellion. So not all Israel was saved eternally. The nation was saved from Egypt, and we see, but then within that remnant of people, there's a smaller remnant, God's chosen people. And so, what Paul is asserting here is this, God has not failed in his word. Why not? Because God's given the promise to Israel, but it's not all of national Israel. It's the elect Israelites, the spiritually elect within. And Paul proves this point. Let's read verses 7 to 9. Can someone read that to us? He gives two illustrations of two families to prove this point. Someone read verse uh, 7. And not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall, you, Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what... For, w- for this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. Okay, so not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. So he's saying not all the physical descendants are Israelites. Not all are descendants of, of Abraham. Why? Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now what does that mean? Why does he bring that up, Isaac? Do you remember Abraham's children? Who are his two sons? Isaac and Ishmael. Who was born first? Ishmael. Who's the one that receives the promises? Now, typically, the firstborn does. The firstborn is the one who receives the inheritance, right? But Ishmael didn't receive the inheritance, but he was Abraham's firstborn. But he says, not all are children of Abraham simply because they're his offspring. Ishmael's not. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. You know what he's saying? He's saying God has chosen Isaac. It's not a physical thing. If it's a physical thing, Ishmael gets the inheritance. But he's saying it's not it's not physical. It's not just physical descendants. Look, verse eight. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise. Of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. So Ishmael's physical Uh, birthplace did not make him the inheritor of his father's blessings. It was the second born Isaac that was granted the promise. Why? Because God chose him. And God promised to give this child to Sarah. Therefore, Isaac, what Paul's saying, was the true Israelite. Not because of physical descent, because God chose him. And you could possibly object, well, that's a simple one. Hagar, the one who birthed Ishmael, was not Abraham's wife. So it was his mother that excluded him because the inheritance had to come through Abraham and Sarah, we could say. And so it was Isaac was the firstborn between Abraham and his wife. There's a possible objection, right? Hagar was simply a servant. Now Abraham had this idea and Sarah, okay, conceived through her because I can't, conceive, Sarah said, and so did, but God could say, no, 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 I said your inheritance is going to be firstborn between you and the wife. Okay, that's a possible objection. So that's perhaps why God chose Isaac, because Abram, Hagar was not Abram's wife. But that objection quickly dissipates when we read on. He gives a second example of a family. Look at verse 10. Someone read to us verse 10 to 13, please. Father Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing either good or bad, 
in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Okay, so now we've moved on to example number two, family number two. This is Isaac's family. Okay, so Isaac now has two sons and they're twins, which means what? They came from the same mother. So now our argument that, well, one was from Hagar and one was from uh, Sarah. Hagar clearly can't be the firstborn because it's the wrong woman. But now he gives an illustration of two sons born of the same woman. But what happens? God chose only one of them to be saved. You see that in um, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Paul is making his point. He's just said back in verse 6, not all who are descended from Israel are belong to Israel. So it's not just your physical inheritance, physical bloodline, it's there's a spiritually elect. And we go, really, Paul? He says, yeah, let me give you two examples. Let me show you Abraham. Here's Ishmael, here's Isaac. God chose Isaac the younger and had him. Though they were both inheritance, inheritors. Then he says, I'll give you another example. Here's Rebekah and Isaac. They had two sons. I chose one of them and not the other. So, not all ethnic Israelites are spiritual Israelites. Jacob was the object of God's salvific love, his saving love, whereas Esau was rejected. Now, here we can get our pens out, and I want us to fill this in. Um, it's these next three lines. Someone read the first line, and then someone, someone else give us the answer. Born. This is before they were born. God chose them. That shows us clearly the reality of Romans 8, right? He predestined us. He says, um, those whom he predestined, he predetermined to be conformed to the image of his son. There's your predestination. So God chose Jacob and he rejected Esau before they had been born. What's the second line? Anything, good or bad. God chose, oh sorry, so God chose before they were born and before they had done any action. You know what Paul's saying? He's, he's, he's building a case here, but he's saying, listen, it has nothing to do with your bloodline. I chose them before they were even born. You say, some born from the same woman, some born from others, same bloodline. Well, it had nothing to do with their birthright. God chose Jacob and rejected Esau before they had done anything good or evil. So now it's not just your bloodline, but it's your, not even your actions have anything to do with this. I chose you before you even did anything. And then what's the third line there? His purpose of election might continue. God has a purpose of election. And he said, I, you know why I've done it this way? You know why I've chosen some and not others? You know why I chose them before they were born? You know why I chose them before they even did anything? Because my purpose of election might continue. It has nothing to do with human action. It has all to do with me. That's what Paul's saying. But then you could think of this possible objection, and this isn't just theory, this is actually an objection. Um, people could say, well, hold on a second, faith isn't a work. So before they had done anything, before they had done any works, God looked forward and saw their faith, and he chose them. Have you heard that objection before? Um, so what would be possible, I have, I have a twofold response there, but what would be a, a possible response to that, Kathleen? There's some kind of goodness 
in us. Like we're not completely, totally depraved and dead. Because if we were, because we are completely dead in our sins, we cannot have faith apart from the Spirit. So if we do have faith, then, then there's some little tiny spark of goodness in us that was able to produce that faith. So it's not from the Spirit of God anymore. And that's, so that right. can't be right. Right. It comes down to an understanding of our sin, doesn't it? This week in our Behold, uh, Behold Your God study, we talked about having a proper understanding of God will give us a proper understanding of, I believe sin was the next, right? Um, we've got to understand our sin. That's why I began with sin. That's the foundation. Our theology will go way off if we think, yeah, men have sinned, but there's a spark of goodness, like Kathleen said. There's, a, there's an aspect of us which really wants to be good and reject our bad, and so then the gospel comes along and we go, oh yeah, I want that. But when we do a thorough examination of sin, we find that we are so permeated with sin in every aspect of who we are that that faith is impossible. We'll always choose our sin. That's the teaching of Scripture. We could go to multiple texts that say faith is a gift. It's been granted to you to believe. Faith is a gift. It's not of works. It's not by our own conjuring up. It's actually been given to us to believe. And so that's a great answer, Kathleen, on the looking at Scripture as a whole. Yeah, brother. It comes down to whether or not we believe salvation is of man or if it's of God. Right. The scripture teaches that it's of God, not of man. The decisive work, the decisive act in salvation is either man ultimately deciding, yes, I will be saved, or it is God ultimately the one who's decisive in your salvation saying, regenerating your heart. So it comes down to what he just said, ultimately, who's in control? Who makes the final call? Man or God? So again, we could go through Scripture, and I believe the testimony of Scripture is clear that it's God. Yeah, brother. It seems like um, uh, people in the, in, you know, in, the, in the camp that think, well, you know, uh, uh, there is some goodness, and, and so I chose God. You know, uh, uh, that leads that leads you to thinking that you know, a lot, uh, having a lesser standard of God and and uh, you know who He is, like, oh, well, He's a friend. You know what I mean? Kind of like. <coughs> I used to be, you know, in that position where I thought, well, you know, I heard about God and I decided, and you're hard headed, you didn't decide, you don't right. want, you know, God. What I think you're hitting on is exactly what we hit on last week in 1 Corinthians. What was the whole reason why God calls, did we see? It was to eliminate boasting, ah. it's to eliminate human boasting, yeah. right? Because one could stand next to the other and say, you were hard headed, I wasn't, I chose you, God, right? That's a source of boasting. So we read things, by, you are saved by grace through faith and not of works, that no one may boast. We're here in 1 Corinthians, he says, um, God chose, I'm sorry, uh, where does he say it? Um, 1 Corinthians 1, um, and because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God chose what is low. God chose what is foolish. God chose what is weak. So we can't boast in it because God chose us and drew us out. So that's absolutely uh, a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful um, answer. Anything else? Um, yeah, go ahead. Just Romans 3, yeah, it says here, none is righteous, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. Right. If those who believe God looks in the future and sees them seeking Him, that's them, mm-hmm. seek, that's right. them seeking Him without Him. Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe the testimony of Scripture gives us no place for this foreknowledge of, of pre-seen faith, and God chooses upon that. Now, look at this. Paul's argument, this is a twofold response I put here. Paul's argument is that this election is completely apart from any human activity. It's purely divine. He's being explicit. I love Paul. I love Scripture, but I love Paul because he is so explicit. He hits things over on the head over and over. Look at the end of verse 11. Or verse 11. Though they were not yet born, had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of Him who calls. 
He's saying before they were born, before they did good, before they did bad. It has nothing to do with human activity. And so for you to squeeze in and say, well, faith isn't really doing anything good. I would argue, no, faith is doing something good. It's good for you to believe. And he says nothing good. He's eliminating human activity here. But secondly, and we'll see this more in a couple weeks, God willing, if God's election was based upon foreknowledge of exercised faith, then Paul's answer to the forthcoming objection, which we'll look at in a few weeks, that God is unjust. So that's what people, look down there. Look uh, in verse 14. What, then shall, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? So people are going to hear this teaching and say, wait a second, God chose not because of works? God's unjust. He can't choose justly between one and not the other. God is unjust. He's unrighteous. Paul knows that's coming. Now, think about this. If God looked forward and saw that people had faith and chose them, someone could say, God chose his election? That's unjust. What would Paul say? No, no, no. It's not unjust. Listen, he looked forward and saw who would pick him. And the other didn't, and the other one did, so... That's why he's not unjust. And the person, oh, okay, you're right. But that's not Paul's answer to the objection. He doesn't, he, he doesn't simply say, well, he, he saw who would choose him, therefore he's not unjust. That would satisfy the, the objectors, right? He doesn't say that. We'll look into what his, his answer is, but he says his response to that objection in verses 15 and 16 is, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. We'll go into those, God willing, in a couple weeks. But, that, I think, clearly shows. All he would have had to say is, well, they had faith, and God saw that, so he picked them. But that's not what he says. So, God's choice to save Jacob and not Esau was not based upon anything in either of them, whether good or bad, but was based solely upon his own sovereign good pleasure. Does that make sense? That's the basis of election. I'll read to you one commentator. This is Douglas Moo. Uh, his insights, I thought, were, were good. He says, First, Jacob and Esau, Esau shared the same father and mother. This silences the objector who might argue that Isaac was preferred over Ishmael simply because they had different mothers. We looked at that. Second, God promised that Jacob would be preeminent before the twins were born, implying that it was God's will alone and not natural capacity, religious devotion, or even faith that, was, that determined their respective destinies. Third, Jacob's being the younger of the two makes it even more clear that normal human preferences had nothing to do with God's choice. Um, I think that's, that's a good insight, especially that last one. You notice that um, Jacob was the younger of the two. He came out second as the twins, so what is he, 30 seconds younger or something, but he's younger. The, the, fir the firstborn receives the inheritance. How often, over and over in Scripture, does God give the inheritance to the less, least likely? To the one who's not, who was, who was I've, I've been reading my devotions, who was King David? He wasn't the oldest, he wasn't the biggest, he wasn't of his, all his brothers, he was the guy she, uh, watching, shepherding the, sh the sheep out there. And uh, do you have any other brothers, Samuel says? Well, yeah, there's a... Or any other sons? Yeah, there's David, but he's out there with the sheep. Go bring him. He makes him the one upon whose throne Jesus Christ sits. It's the least likely. Why? Is it because of what David did? No, you're sheep, shepherding sheep. It's not because of him. It's because God chose. That's exactly Paul's point. God chose Jacob, the younger, the least likely so that he would rule the older. He chose Isaac. Why? Firstborn? No. So that his promise might stand. He chose him. Well, it was certainly because of, I mean, these, you know, Esau was, was arrogant and pompous and, and uh, Jacob wasn't. No, it has nothing to do with their works, neither good nor bad. It was chosen before they were born. That's the election. That's Paul's uh, foundation here. Now, I do want to answer one question here. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions you'd like to ask? <coughs> yes, yeah, sister. Yeah, God's choice to save Jacob and Esau was not based upon anything in either of them, whether good or bad. 
God's choice to save Jacob and Esau was not based upon anything in either of them, whether good or bad, but was based solely upon his own sovereign good pleasure. Now, so any other thoughts or questions? I do want to answer this question. Um, what does Paul mean when he writes in 9.13, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated? What do you think he means? Have you ever wrestled with that? I don't think that he means hated. Just like less. I think it's maybe the translation. I don't think he hated Esau. Okay, so that's, that's a common... Does anybody agree with that or think that might be it? I'm not saying you have to declare your theological stance right now and stick to it forever. Um, okay, that would be the comparative view. So, the, in comparing love and hate, it's comparative. We look at, turn to Genesis, let's look at a few scriptures. Turn to Genesis 29. So, um, Genesis 29, to support um, Joshua's thought here. Genesis 29, verse 30 and 30, or someone read verse 30. So he loved her more than Leah. So Rachel was more loved than Leah was. Now read verse 31, Daniela. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So you see the contrast there? It, it could be just a comparative language where he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. And when God saw that Leah was hated... Well, it doesn't necessarily imply that he was adamantly, actively hating Leah, but he just loved her less, right? Look at um, Luke 14. Turn to Luke 14, and we see this exemplified in the Gospel. Gospels, Luke 14. Luke 14, 26, and then uh, Michael J.R., can you read Matthew 10, 37 after Luke 14? Someone to read Luke 14, uh, 26. Esteban, thanks. And then Michael J.R., um, you can read Matthew 10.37. Hope you don't mind me volunteering you, Esteban. <laughs> Luke 14.26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Thank you, Tracy. So there, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, can't be my disciple. Is Jesus teaching familial hatred as a requirement for the, to be saved? Is that what he's teaching? Why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he just said, if you don't hate him. Right, well, um, yeah, saying, is, is this possibly what God could be saying? He says, you've got to hate your mother and father. Like, you love God so much, it's as if you hate. Okay, well, read your text. Matthew ten thirty seven. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So we could look at this comparatively and say, in the parallel account, Luke here has Jesus saying, if you don't hate your father and mother, Matthew says, if you love your father and mother more than me, if you love them more. So what Ashley's implying there. So is this a comparative statement? He doesn't really hate Jacob. Um, he just loved, or Esau, but he just loved Jacob more. So comparatively, it looks like hatred. Yeah, sister. Could it be like what we just called, we discussed in the Behold of God, like the level of drunkenness? It's perhaps we don't know what hatred really is. Yeah, that's very, very insightful. So, yeah, Luke. How does the Hebrew word compare to the Greek word? The Hebrew word compared to the Greek? I haven't studied, looked at the Greek and Hebrew for this. Um, But it's the concept of the comparison. So that would be excellent study to do, to go back and look at hatred um, in in the Greek and Hebrew. Um, 
But what you've just said, Daniela, is very, very insightful in that you're saying we've got to look at hatred not from a human perspective and how we might perceive it, but say there's a hatred that God can show which would be a pure hatred. Um, let's, let's think about that. Let's think about a holy hatred versus a saving love here. Um, because the other view, Joshua is stating that, okay, maybe this is comparative and it's, you know, he loves him less, so it, it could be seen as hatred. Um, but then let's look at this view of God not only rejected Esau, but actively hating Esau. And I have a few texts here I want us to look up. Um, can someone turn to Psalm 5.5, Esteban, and Psalm 5.5 5 and Psalm 11.5, Esteban. Can someone do Proverbs 6.16-19? 6, to 19? Can I get a volunteer for that? Daniela? Hosea 9.15. Kathleen? And Malachi 1, 2 to 5. Ashley. Let's read those, uh, read those quickly here. Psalm 5, 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. And then the Psalm 11, 5. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Hmm. Read Psalm 5 5 again, that's the one. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. There's God's active hatred of the evildoer. He says, I hate the evildoer. Um, Proverbs 6 16 and 19. There are six things that the Lord hates seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. So there we have the Lord's hatred actively being directed toward the evil, towards the wicked, false witnesses, those who sow discord, the divisive person, he hates them, the Proverbs tell us. Um, Hosea 9.15 There I began to hate them. The object of God's hatred is the wicked. Malachi 1, 2 and 5. 2 to 5. Ashley. So there we have what Paul brings up here in our chapter. Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. I will, he says, um, the, the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. I've laid waste his whole country, left his heritage to jackals of the desert. So there we, have, we do have clearly taught in Scripture there is an active hatred of God toward the wicked. And so we come back to Romans 9, and I want to make this point uh, that Daniela very insightfully made, um, that we must be careful here. So however we're studying this object, where, or this statement where he says, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated, we must be careful in the sense of perhaps it's the comparative view where you say, okay, he loves him less, but Scripture speaks very, very clearly, as we've just seen, that God actively hates. And even here in Malachi, it would show us that when he says, Jacob, I love Esau, I hated, it's an active hatred towards Esau. But we must be careful. And for this reason, I want to read to you uh, an insightful word from uh, John Murray on his, his, his commentary on the Romans. He says this on Romans. He says, we do not predicate or, or attribute to this, of this divine hate, those unworthy features which belong to hate as it is exercised by us sinful men. 
In God's hate there is no malice, malignancy, vindictiveness, unholy rancor, or bitterness. The kind of hate thus characterized is condemned in Scripture, and it would be blasphemy to predicate the same of God. Did I put that quote on your... Okay. So, what he's saying is, it appears clear from the testimony of Scripture, from Paul bringing up this instance of Jacob and Esau, that God actively hates Esau. But it's not with an unholy bitterness, vindictiveness, malignancy, uh, to which we ascribe human hatred. It is a pure, divine, holy hatred. Now, we're going to stop for this morning, but ending there ought to have burning in our minds the thought, Is God unjust? Is God unrighteous? Before they'd done either good or bad, he hated Esau? Can God be holy in that election? That's what we'll consider next time. Go ahead and read and study. Do your own study on Romans 9. It's critical that we understand Paul's reasoning here um, in our understanding of this doctrine. So why don't, we, why don't we end there? The second hour of the sermon, I really wanted to get this base of understanding of God's election for the purpose of, of the sermon in the second hour. Um, so have this mulling in your minds as we, as we approach um, the worship service. So why don't we pray, then we'll close here. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that it is profitable and useful to your people. Lord, I want to feed your sheep with your word and your truth to build them up for their encouragement and edification. I pray that would be the case. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.